Hello and welcome to my second Vigan video in the Vigan AGS 37 in DCS. This is the second video I'm doing, but the first one in English by popular demand. Also by popular demand, this is Night Mission. We're going to attack a group of targets on the uh, east, uh, west coast of, uh, of uh, Russia on the Straits to Crimea. Uh, for this mission, we're going to attack the targets using BK-90s submunition dispensers, and we're going to look at that one a little bit. The Vigan, in AG, uh, the Vigan in DCS is a very good model by Hitper, uh, which is really well implemented. There are very few differences from this model and the real thing. Um, but we'll like, look into that later on. Uh, since this is the first video in English, I'll run through a few of the things, or a lot of the things that I already spoke about in my Swedish video. So if you saw that one and didn't understand what I was speaking about, you'll have to bear with me. So, uh, going through the cockpit quickly, on the uh, right hand side of the cockpit here we've got four backup uh, instruments. We have the engine in instruments here with a afterburn indication sector, like one to three stages. Uh, G-meter, uh, fuel load, 103%. Distance to selected waypoints, which is shown here. G meter, I might have said it already. And what was that? That was DCS doing something weird with the sunlight. Never mind. Uh, the clock, a few uh, selection knobs for the HUD. On the left hand side, a altimeter and all the gauges. Most of the gauges start at the bottom, so altimeter starts at the bottom and goes clockwise. In meters, speed in kilometers per hour with basically any speed on the right hand si side being slow and anything on the left hand side being appropriate. The um, speedometer here uh, does show you a small triangle or tick mark here for safe uh, gear out speed and it's also logarithmic so that the distance between 200 and 300 kilometers is further than between like 900 and 1000 kilometers per hour because the difference in speed here is less important. A few other things that we're in over later on. The ADI, though, is really important in this aircraft, especially the flight director, the yellow bars. It also has your only uh, way to determine uh, climb and sink rates on the left-hand side here. AOA indicator, which basically shows anything up to 30 AOAs. You can fly up to 22, given the right circumstances. Um, basically, on our left-hand side, we've got a few light switches, a radar, control, uh, radio, and engine control. On the right-hand side, we've got our jammers and shaft dispenser settings, uh, exterior lights, uh, navigation system, uh, onboard computer, weapon selector, and a few settings for engine power and such, and also your fuses and everything else. So this is going to get dark really soon, so we better get going. Uh, to crank up this engine, uh, I'll close the canopy first because it does get a bit noisy. And I'll turn on the exterior lights so that people around me are aware that I'm starting the engine. There we go. Starting the engine is a very simple process, which is fully automated in the Vigan. So um, main switch on low pressure fuel valve on, uh, main uh, generator on, high press pressure fuel valve on, and starter. I'll kill the warning meanwhile. That's all you have to do to start the engine. Everything else in this procedure is basically to set all the systems online. So one of the th first things you do is you insert your Nintendo game cartridge back there, which holds your mission. And I will turn on the interior lights, because it is going to get dark. Three knobs of that. Waiting for everything to spool up, I'll set this selector to off. It's not important at all, just one of my preferences, per per personal preferences. I'm now waiting for the computer to boot. Meanwhile, I'll uh, turn on the oxygen. I'll set the weapon sector to the uh, already to the station, which I'm going to be using later in the mission. So attack mode for the BK-90s. And the other selectors here and switches for the BK-90s, I'm not going to touch them at all at this, in this mission. They're already as they should be. 
back here is actually something which you would actually turn and switch um, manually in real life. It sets your magnetic deviation, but it's already preset to 6 degrees, which is uh, the value for uh, Crimea. Now the computer is on, the, the computer display is on, and a few other indications are on here. So first things first, let's load the um, data cassette or data cartridge into the computer memory. So to do that, you enter a special code 1999 and you press enter and you wait for the display to show zeros. Once that's done, we can now verify that we do have a landing starting point, which is very close to us because we are at the landing start point or the, the runway where we're going to start. Uh, and we can also select the different waypoints and waypoint 4 happens to be the attack point. So let's look at that one, B4 selected. And the distance to B4 is 11 times 10 because it's a mile here, so 110 kilometers and basically due west. So we know that that is the correct position more or less or according to pre-plan. Uh, we're now going to check on the uh, landing runway and see what heading uh, the system wants us to land in and it's decided to select runway 039 for our landing, decimal 5 actually, which is wrong. We don't want the 039, we do want to land on the 219, so let's click on landing waypoint once again to switch it to the opposite runway. And same thing for starting runway, we don't want to start on the uh, runway 4, we do, do want to start on runway 22, so let's select landing start point, look at the runway heading and flip them over to 22. Okay, that's done. We do have information here regarding wind and a few other things, but uh, we're not going to touch anything of this. We could, here with the BK-90s, uh, designate our target point 4 as a, mi as a mission target point. We don't need to, it's going to be fine with uh, the way it is, so I'll leave it as it is as a B4, uh, a break point 4. B for breakpoint works as well as W for the waypoint. I don't know why they chose to translate that in the um, English translation of a cockpit, but it is the way it is. So everything's set. These are pylons which are in use on our aircraft. So pylons uh, 1 and 6 are empty and then I got weapons on pylons 2, 3, 4 and 5. Center line pylon for a fuel tank is not shown. Setting the computer back in actual position actual position and out, sets the computer in its default mode, showing you, you or me, my current longitude and latitude, uh, and a navigation error of one kilometer with a position of zero, which is, well, it's a precision of zero means that the system is not active yet, which is because I haven't started moving or flying. It's going to get up to a figure between two and five later on. Five is good, and anything lower than five is worse. So, turning on the tax lights, we do have a guy standing in front of the aircraft, which is not a problem. Yellow light here is because I haven't still either closed my canopy, which I do have, or armed my seat, which I haven't. So, seat armed, no more warning lights on this annunciation panel, and three greens on this one indicating the gear out. So, this would actually do it for a checklist for the uh, takeoff and the beginning of the game in real life, of course. Check this is much longer, but this does it for the game. So let's get going and I'll start taxi and see if that guy decides to move out of my way or not. Good thing he did that. Might have hurt a bit. Okay, so taxiing. Um, I'm not gonna use my rudder steering, nose wheel steering, sorry, with my rudder pedals mainly. Of course, and um, I'm going to turn left here to head towards the north side of the airport since I'm going to take off towards the south, roughly. So one of the misconceptions about the Vigan I've spoken about, and that is that this is an analog uh, aircraft. Uh, diving into that question a little bit more, uh, well, the navigation is digital with a TerraNav system which actually measures the uh, Undulations under the aircraft compares that to a 3D map in the navigation system computer, the CK37 computer here, the main central compu computer. 
uh, and updates your navigation error or deletes the error uh, continuously as you fly. That is something which uh, no other aircraft really have at the time. Uh, and it was only superseded by, by GPS navigation later. Uh, another misconception about the aircraft is that it's hard to to make a uh, to to be precise when you land or when you take off because nose with steering is always on a very high um, has a high uh, level of of, of uh, authority. The thing is that you don't actually steer on the runway with your nose wheel steering. You only steer with differential braking as I'm doing right now here. This turn here I'm doing by differentially braking right. That's the way you steer on the runway. You never steer the aircraft on the runway using the nose wheel steering like this which actually turns the uh, headlight or nose wheel uh, taxi light. So that is one thing. Um, other, th other things that people I would say get wrong is that they are not using um, the HUD the right way, we get into that later, uh, or the navigation system. Uh, they think that it's a very complicated navigation system when in fact it's very precise and actually um, does take the load off, takes the load off the pilots quite a lot. The workload in the Vigan is fairly low, especially compared to American aircraft such as the A10C or, or the F5, the, I mean regardless of your preference. The Viggen is a very fast accelerating aircraft, which means that we don't need a whole lot of runway, and that in turn means that we can take off from this first taxiway up leading to the runway. Now the sun is setting, it's going to get dark very soon, and in this mission we're going to attack in the blind, uh, the, the targets on the coast. But I do have a SU-25 set up to illuminate the area just uh, so that we can actually see anything or something on the area. It's not important for a mission as such. Uh, I could actually do this, I mean, in the dark as well. But uh, the lights are there for, let's say, um, visibility reasons. Okay, getting up to a runway like this, I turn on the uh, navigation system by uh, switching this lever here to nav mode, right there, and uh, that turns on the HUD. I'm going to take off from the right hand side here, just as if I had a wingman. So important things to do in the Vigan before taking off is actually standing still a little bit like this and uh, checking your HUD, which uh, is now set to takeoff mode if you're engaged the navigation system coming out from off position with the LS waypoint selected, the HUD sets up in takeoff mode, which shows you an indication for um, rolling speed uh, or rotation speed when the horizontal line here grows to the size of these two tick marks, that's your rotation speed. And after that, it's just a matter of uh, follow of putting the FPM marker above the, these reference lines. It's all basically automatic, so it's really simple. Oh yeah, I'm going to turn on my torchlight as well here, so I got something to shine on the cockpit because the cockpit in DCS-25 is really dark. Okay, so uh, LS actual position uh, on the computer out three greens. Uh, and uh, that should be it. So running up to 100% on the brakes and 3, 2, 1, release brakes and add burners to you can now see the horizontal line grow be between these two tick marks. Also you will see the compass jump by 6 degrees when the system there adjusts for the um, for the uh, mag magnetic deviation does that as you accelerate through 200 kilometers per hour it takes the average of your heading when you run when you're rolling and uh, adjusts your compass heading for the deviation that you actually set on the uh, knob on the back side of your on your on your right hand side back here and uh, then uh, adjusts everything automatically, so it's really helpful. Okay, so uh, gear up. I've done that already. I didn't say so. I have that um, on the hotters assigned to a key, and now I'm gonna take. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna 
hold up the HUD. And look at my speed. Climb to 800 kilometers per hour soon. 750. So I'm gonna get out of burners. And I am at 550 meters. Climb to 600 meters. And turning on the autopilot. There we go. Full autopilot to keep altitude and heading. The red light comes on because there is ter terrain undulations ahead of us, but I can see for myself that there is no danger, so I'm not going to take notice of that. But basically the red light means that something ahead of you is lower or changing altitude rapidly. Okay, distance to waypoint 1 is 5 kilometers. This horizontal line here shows us the time to waypoint. Right now it's 10 seconds. So it's 30 seconds, sorry, 60 seconds, 20 seconds, Jesus Christ, 60 seconds, 40 seconds, 20 seconds, and we are now at the waypoint. So it's going to switch over to B2, breakpoint 2, there we go, boom, and it's to our right. So with a single click of the trim on the um, stick, it puts us into a turn that's going to, I'm going to abort, I'm abort, I'm going to, do the opposite command to get out of later on. Keep my out out of the window uh, so I can actually see the terrain, and I just dimmed the HUD a little bit. Now switching on radar is very very bright as well, so let's dim that a bit so the cockpit actually gets comfortable. It's better. And we're now on heading towards breakpoint 2. Okay, I'm not going to bother about getting up to altitude or anything. Uh, what is important to fire the BK-90s is that I get a, as a high precision as possible on navigation. Because if I am on a 5 here on my central computer uh, for Terranav, well then the BK-90s are also in Terranav, which means that they are going to be precise. If my precision is low, the BK-90's precision are going to be low as well, and I'm very likely to hit, to miss. This actually means that you can't really fire the BK-90's from a super flat terrain or from the sea, because the precision is going to be really low. Okay, so distance to next waypoint is 5 times 10, so 50 kilometers. And I'll speak a bit, bit about reference lines up in the HUD. So the HUD is very naked compared to American aircraft especially. The reason is that you don't really need information on HUD for anything else than reference. I mean, you do have everything in the cockpit and the information on the HUD is very precise. So reference lines are now set to a bit over my current altitude because the bars extend above the horizontal line. I can simply, by clicking on the stick, on the button on the stick, reset the reference lines to a different altitude or the current altitude. Now they're set to my current altitude which happens to be 600 meters barometric or 540 meters radar because this switch is set to radar. Now if the train sinks or um, rises in front of me or beneath me, the, the bars are going to fall or rise with the train so I can actually know my relative altitude to train by looking at the reference lines and I don't need to look at numbers. And this, this makes the whole aircraft a whole lot simpler to manage because you don't need to fixate your sight on reading numbers. There's li very little of number reading in the, in the Viggen at all. Uh, and even if you go to, to more modern aircraft like the Gripen, uh, it's fairly empty of numbers. It's not a Swedish way of doing things in the cockpit. We, we prefer to have pie charts, uh, lines and, and other indications. Okay, the radar is now on normal attack mode, which means that it's slanted downwards towards so that the radar uh, sweep is in the middle of the screen. There, It's looking more or less to the middle of the screen. If I put radar with a button on uh, button click on the uh, throttle to um, terrain avoidance mode, it looks straight ahead. And this gives me a terrain, terrain avoidance view. So it doesn't see anything below me because it's too near, but it does see the hills and everything uh, uh, 
in front of me. And unless something is really black, well, then I don't have anything dangerous in front of me. This ring here is my waypoint. So, uh, judging by this, I would be some 40 kilometers away. Or less, 30. 20, actually. Sorry. So, 20. 20 kilometers away. So, I can see from radar that I'm fairly safe. But I can also see the reference line here. This is the same reference line as the one in the HUD. So, also, what I can also see is the big red light here, which is not blinking. If this red light blinks, and I'm broad daylight, well, markers on the HUD will also blink. So, regardless of where I'm looking at, I do get the same indication, which means I can already in this aircraft, which was made back in the 70s, fly heads down or heads up. And uh, that is quite unique as well. So, we're nearing uh, waypoint 2 getting close to that one, we're like 46 seconds away, and again, no time indication, no numbers. I can judge this by this line here between the reference lines. The flight director shows me the same indications as the HUD, so the horizontal line is reference attitude, the vertical line is navigation queue. And you can see the HUD moving to the side of the de deviation. So if the flight director is to the right, well, the HUD steering dot is to the right. This is the way that Saab implemented the HUD back in the 70s. Okay, going for breakpoint 3, uh, which is our IP, I'm going to drop altitude and uh, go a little bit faster. So turning off the um, autopilot. I'm going to drop to 130 meters thereabouts and head towards breakpoint 2. So I can now judge my, by my lines that there were 500 meters, so this is 2 fifths, so that is 300 meters, that's 250 meters, and I can actually also see the number on the side, but even by not looking at a number, I can judge my altitude. Okay, 150 meters right there. That's good. Updating the reference line altitude for 150 meters. These fourth bars are 100 meters tall always. And turning on my autopilot again. Flying 140 meters. These are lights over the target area. We're 30 seconds out of the IP. Launching BK-90s is simple. All I need to do is uh, accelerate a bit. Uh, to Mach 08 thereabouts, keep an altitude of roughly 200 meters, I mean between 50 and 500, and fire on Q. So uh, we're at B3, and waiting for the waypoint to switch to B4, and switch coming right, there we go, okay, so we're running in to target area, going to attack mode, uh, the line now on the bottom shows me the firing solution, and when the horizontal line is between the exterior tick marks, I can fire. So all I need to do now is roughly head towards the steering dot and wait for the horizontal line to shrink. And once it's shrunk, unsafing, waiting, 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 and firing BK-90s. There we go. Gonna put myself in autopilot and command a turn while I look at the target area from a vehicle I placed there previously. So there is a group of targets. We should also see our Vigan right there, passing by, and the BK-90s are going to follow shortly. And there they came, and boom, those are high explosive uh, submunitions, and here come the fragmentation uh, submunitions. So that was an effect. Most of the targets are taken out, a few of the uh, Soldiers are still standing, very obedient, and a few of the tanks or uh, vehicles are still intact, but uh, that was a successful attack, I would say. Okay, back to the cockpit, uh, holding 200 meters on radar, and uh, I'm going to switch to B5 manually, because I didn't overfly B4, and we still have to turn 45 degrees to head towards that one. Getting out of attack mode, I'm now going to look at a little bit more at the radar because it's really dark in this direction and also I'm fairly low, 200 meters. So I need to trust the red light, I need to trust what I see on the radar and I need to look at reference lines and see that I'm not losing altitude reference or 
in reference to the altitudes, altitude chosen. Okay, we're now heading towards B5, which is just 5 kilometers away and 10 seconds out, but it's fine. So, using my trim switch on the joystick, I command a level flight. And you can clearly see the HUD moving to the side with the deviation of the waypoints, but that's close enough. Okay, next waypoint is just to the left here a little bit. So, commanding left turn and going back straight. And I'm 220 meters, uh, radar altitude as seen in the HUD, and I'm going to set my reference altitude for that. Or 200 meters now because of the terrain differences. So, again, on the radar screen, you can actually see the 100 meter reference bars and the normal reference bars. And it's flat and ahead of us, so I'm not, I'm not scared to fly this altitude heads down or anything because I know that there's nothing out there which is dangerous. Except that the radar and DCS doesn't see buildings or cranes and other structures. So I am going to fly up a little bit and get a new higher altitude. And judging just by the reference lines, even I do it like this, looking without numbers, I can actually determine that I'm now at roughly 400 meters. And there we go, that should be about 500 meters. And looking at the screen, I'm at 430 meters, but that's fine. So it's it's very rough, but a very well working system. Updating reference lines, engaging all the pilots. Okay, so. Breakpoint six is roughly the same as uh, the turn, the, the the lead turn for the landing approach turn, uh, which is still some 80 kilometers out. Uh, as we get nearer to B6, I'm going to actually manually select landing point and uh, show a bit of the instrument landing system on the uh, Vigan. Oh yeah, I forgot about that one. I didn't turn off my uh, anti-collision light, the red light which was rotating below the aircraft, which you should actually turn off before takeoff. Okay, we're roughly at 50 kilometers from the, or 60 from the uh, turn points, which is, as I said, the same as the landing approach turn points. So let's manually select landing points. You don't need to do, do that, but I'm going to do that anyway. So landing point one, which is the main runway, which we preset to runway 219 or runway 22. Uh, this point here is now just like any navigation point uh, on, and right now shows you the um, a runway with the extended runway line here, which is uh, the, the, the way you're supposed to land on. Now, I'm going to do something else. going to put the system into landing nav, like that, and that updates the navigation system to landing break point one. That's put, that gives me a, a new waypoint right here, which is on the far side of the uh, run, sen runway center line, about 20 kilometers away. The steering guidance now on the HUD here and the flight director points me towards this point here on the circle. So it guides me to the circle, then commands a turn through the circle to catch the ILS along this line here. So, uh, and also this always defaults the um, 
reference system to 500 meters because it does want you to be at 500 meters doing this whole maneuver. It also expects your speed to be somewhere between 750 and 550. So let's decelerate and head towards the steering dot on the HUD or the flight director lines. And also gain some altitude because we are a little bit low. Okay, 500 meters on the um, altimeter here, which is the uh, desired sp uh, altitude for the approach and speed slowly decelerating through 750. And radar shows in snow obstructions ahead of us and we're on under the correct path towards the ex outside of the steering circle for the landing. This is the first phase of the landing, LB instrument landing. Next phase is LF. The LF is going to command the turn through this circle, or actually sh through the circle like this in, in a shorter way, to capture the ILS system. Now it's not the ordinary ILS system which is in line with the runway, but rather this one is actually slanted by three degrees to the uh, right hand side of the runway as we approach it. And that is because the Wigan ILS system is based of on, on a truck which sits next to runway so of course it's going to broadcast its guide beams sideways re relative to the uh, runway. We will see that once we get there. So we're now 24 kilometers out from uh, the airport but we're less than that from the uh, steering queue. This is the distance to the actual uh, airport, which is on our uh, right-hand side here. So way out there somewhere. And soon this system is going to switch to LF mode, and the HUD is going to jump a little bit. I'm going to stay in autopilot and show that unlike the uh, normal way the, the autopilot works, uh, it doesn't disengage by using the stick. Rather, you give steering commands with the stick. So I can stay in autopilot and give steering commands to adjust my course. Okay, there it jumped, so it's now commanding a slight right-hand right hand turn here. So I'm gonna try and adjust with that and keep the uh, flight director bars crossed or the steering dot in the center of the FPM marker on the HUD. And I'm going to let the speed drop, because once we're out of this turn, uh, the system wants me to be at 550 uh, kilometers per hour, ready to drop the gear. Now, the Viggen is known for short runway landings with the reverser, but uh, it's not common, common to do that in the dark. Okay, uh, I'll get back to that one. The HUD jumped quite a bit there. That is because we've now caught the ILS system. So it's now going to command a turn to actually catch, capture the, the, um, the, the glide beam, the guide beam, sorry. So looking at all this, we just need to follow the uh, indication on the hood. And there we go. Like that, and I'm going to disengage autopilot this time and go manual. And you can see by the flight director bars, I'm a little bit low and a little bit to the left, the right, sorry, but that's not a problem. And we're at 18 kilometers, so I'm going to drop my gear once my speed drops below 550. 550, and gear down. Oh yeah, that. Okay, we're one minute from uh, the next phase, basically, uh, which is going to be the final phase. Oh, fun! Thank you! Stupid system. Okay, never mind that. Okay, so... Getting back on track here. I lost a little bit of concentration with all that, so you can see by the uh, reference bars I'm a little bit low, but... This is not going to be a problem. Looking at the speed, 350 is a tad low for this phase, but it's not a problem. And what I need to do now is lower the HUD 
and prepare for next phase. Now the fin on the FPM is detached from the FPM marker indicating my AOA is too low for landing. I need to slow down to get my AOA right for landing but we're not landing yet so that's not a problem. Okay next phase. We now have a new horizontal line which is dropped by 2.86 degrees. Uh, that line uh, shows me the correct approach uh, angle uh, which is now going to guide me to the uh, uh, touchdown point on the runway. All I need to do again is to keep everything crossed which I'm not doing at all here. Uh, I should do it this wrong way. Okay, look in the flight director bars. That's much better and I'm a bit low but not a big problem. The runway ahead of us, and you, as you can see, we're actually coming in from the side, which is correct. This is the way the thing works. Now, it's not a full guidance system. I need to do the final stages manually. So, look in the runway, judging with the, the dropped horizontal bar, and look in the FPM marker a little bit like this, and trying to line everything up correctly on the HUD. And we do have a side, side one, which is quite important. We'll adjust for that. It's not a problem. Okay, this is better. Okay, we're at the final stages now. FPM marker shows sync rate and salting back. Then the AOA rise a little bit here. And that's fine. That's okay to touch down. Uh, as I said previously, never use your nose with steering. Once you touch down, rather use your differential braking. So normal braking. No reversers. That's going to do. It's not perfect, but it, it's okay. Now that the speed is under control, I can actually use my nozzle steering to taxi normally. Okay, turning off the radar, actually. Um, the screen is still on because it's showing me uh, guidance from my landing, but that's not important. So there it is. This is one mission in the uh, Vigan. Uh, I wouldn't say this typical mission. I don't. I, w I don't know that Vigan pilots train doing these types of missions too much, uh, but uh, it does showcase. Uh, the way that the Vigan can be used uh, low, uh, quite fast, and attacking targets uh, with high precision without being in danger itself. Um, there were ships out in the bay ready to fire at us, which they didn't do because we were too low. The targets on the coast were active. They didn't fire back at all because uh, I came in too hidden from uh, the the land side too low and too fast. So basically the system is capable of uh, taking care of itself and it's, it's a very capable platform once you get to use it properly. It's not an A-10, it doesn't carry 3000 weapons under wings but uh, it, it is it is powerful. Okay so I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, like this clip and uh, subscribe and leave a comment. So, thank you, and till next time.